Hi there. Welcome to our Performance Edge Weekly Wisdom, where spirit drive performance. Coach Soul here. Today we are going to discuss the biggest opportunity in mental health. And what is that? It is a need for spiritual intelligence. Yes, spiritual intelligence. Specifically, how developing spiritual intelligence can help improve psychological well-being. First, we'll see how, through many researches, show that spirituality is linked with better health outcome patient care. Second, we'll see how further research sustain how trauma survivors can harness spiritual awareness to process stress. So by the end of this video today, not only will you understand how spiritual intelligence is an untapped approach to help people improve psychological well-being, and why it is paramount at this moment. But also I will share with you why using applied spirit is the best strategy that will help us resolve the pandemic of mental health spread. And best of all, exclusively here, I will share with you why we have entered a new era. Yes, I'm excited about that. And it's the era of homo triple sapiens because the homo sapiens sapiens or the homo double sapiens is going to be instinct if you don't adapt and learn. The homo triple sapiens, on the other hand, is able to leverage spiritual intelligence using practical common strategy for managing mental constraint into more flow and optimal results. So I will share with you from an applied spirit lens that was understood from ancient and secular wisdom since ancient Egypt, which will give you a sustainable solution and formula to resolving mental restriction moving forward. Ready? Let's jump in. Yes, so World Mental Health Day was just two weeks ago. And while we can celebrate the recognition of an international day for global mental health education and awareness, the truth is that now is a time and it's an inflection point for the mental health community to embrace the biggest opportunity yet untapped. And it is spiritual intelligence. In today's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, or the VUCA world, the VUCA world, we see the many demands in our lives that have highlighted the challenges that are multi-leveled and more complex. So here in this video, we will explore spiritual intelligence role in improving healthcare, not only mentally, but how it affects how its effect also has a positive impact holistically on people's well-being. So you might have heard of emotional intelligence, but after watching today's video, you will learn what spiritual intelligence is and how developing spiritual intelligence is, is the best strategy to help resolve the mental health pandemic our society is facing currently. I will share the research and the studies that shows how spirituality is linked with better health, better outcome, patient care, and even further, how trauma survivor, yes, trauma survivor can harness spiritual intelligence to process stress better. Also, most importantly, in today's video, you will understand why we have entered the new era of homo triple sapiens. Who is leveraging its spirit? to create more flow, to create more ease, to create more optimal alignment in their lives. So I will introduce you to a totally new understanding of how human operates from an applied spirit lens, which will help you transform any mental, cyclic constraint you will encounter moving forward, whether it's at work or in improving your performance or in your personal life. So lastly, if you stick 
around till the end, I will teach you a practical insight that you can use even during the most acute mental constraint you might be facing that will help you get aligned moving forward when you need to resolve restriction. So if you think about it, when you think about spiritual intelligence, it is defined as a human capacity to ask questions about the ultimate meaning of life and the integrated relationship between us and the world in which we live. It results in an increase in psychological well-being of individuals as well as having a goal in their life. So from a professional lens, according to an article in Medical Express from Harvard School of Public Health, spirituality linked with better health outcome and patient care. That's a fact. And the findings are clear. Spirituality should be incorporated into care for both serious illness and overall health, according to a study led by researchers at Harvard. And uh, the study represents the most rigorous and comprehensive systemic analysis of the modern day literature regarding health and spirituality to date said, according to Tracy Balboni, right? And she's a professor of radiation oncology at Harvard Medical Schools. And she said basically, quote, our findings indicate that attention to spirituality in serious illness and health should be a vital part of future whole person centered care. And the results should stimulate more national discussion and progress on how spirituality can be incorporated into this type of value sensitive care. So these are the facts and it's research I've shown. So when you look at the current methodology and the current approach, there are about three findings we'll talk about here. But the first finding, according to the International Consensus Conference on Spiritual Care and in Healthcare, they say spirituality is a way individuals seek ultimate meaning, purpose, connection, value, or transcendence. And this could include organized religions but extend well beyond to include ways of finding ultimate meaning by connecting, for example, to family, to community, or nature. So what they see is that for many patients, spirituality is important and influence key outcomes in illness, such as quality of life and medical care decisions. So consensus implication included incorporating consideration of spirituality as part of patient center health care and increasing awareness among clinicians and health professionals about the protective benefits of spiritual community participation. That's the first finding. And when you look at the second findings, at the heart of a groundbreaking new book from the University of Huddersfield, their professor Melanie Rogers, she explores spirituality role in improving healthcare. And the findings are clear. There is a need for improving patient care by widening awareness of spirituality for health and social care clinicians. And the book draws upon Professor Rogers' own experiences as an advanced nurse practitioner, as well as case study from around the world from advanced pra pra practice nurse, which will help clinicians recognize how simple it can be to integrate spirituality into their practice. And Professor Rogers' innovative approach to teaching recently actually saw her named as a National Teaching Fellow for Excellence in Higher Education, in particular advanced practice and spirituality. And this is where she helped cl clarify. And that's important because if you ask someone what they think spirituality is, a lot of people conflate it straight away with religion. And Professor Rogers suggests that these are two different concepts with some overlap qualities. For example, if somebody has a faith, this will often overlap with their spirituality. However, spirituality is much broader as it concerns what gives each of us hope, meaning, and purpose. For some, it might be a path or work or relationship that give hope, meaning, and purpose. So it's really important how she framed that and for people to really understand the difference. And the third finding, take it to the next level and shows how studies, how trauma, yes, trauma survivors can harness spiritual contemplation to process stress. And the recent study found um, spiritual 
but not necessarily religious. Again, that spiritual practices such as pondering how life experiences relate to our understanding of who we are and our place in the world encourages to help process trauma. And the main pillar is that spirituality is about exploring who we are and how we relate to ourselves and others. It can help people think about experiences in a way that helps people feel safe and structured. And even some researchers have people found that people who are more spiritual but not necessarily religious experience less distress after trauma. So we thought this could be a cause. This could be because people who have spiritual beliefs tend to explore their core beliefs in response to changing life circumstances. In other words, because spiritual practice involves a lot of deliberate rumination, a lot of thinking, self-reflection. And the fact is that by probing your beliefs about who you are and what mattered to you before and after the trauma help rebuild your personality security. So this is a kind of deliberate self-reflection people who have a spiritual inclination built into the fabric of their life, the fabric of their practices every day. So when you look at that viewpoint, the current result, you look at the study that was conducted in different areas. And this is a study that investigates the relationship between spiritual intelligence with purpose in life and psychological well-being among the nurses. So that's a study that looked at 270 nurses and that looked at the connection between spiritual intelligence with purpose and life psychological well-being. And the results are that the study was a disruptive correlation study and in that study, 270 nurses were selected from some hospital. And the results were showed that there was a significant relationship between spiritual intelligence with psychological well-being and having a purpose in life. So, and the conclusion they had was that um, the high level of spiritual intelligence in nurses helps them to improve their psychological well-being and have a purpose in life, which of course can lead to a health provision of them and their patient. So you look at all those studies that proving that the correlation of how nowadays it's clear that spiritual intelligence help improve the mental health. Now, the biggest problem and the limitation we are seeing, right, is this. Because the biggest problem comes from the limitation of the current paradigm and our understanding of how humans operate, especially in that field. So the, this is where it's really important to pay attention because the homo double sapiens, right? In other words, our ancestor, right? The homo sapiens sapiens, the evolution is well known, right? Because the homo sapiens sapiens says, I know that I know, right? In other words, to simplify, it's a basically, you can think about what you just thought about, right? That's what the homo double sapiens hallmark is all about. You can think about what you just thought about, right? That faculty is powerful, right? That's what led us to a cognitive reasoning, the mental faculties. But now it's important to see how it is limited, right? But before we get into that, but it's important to say that with Homo double sapiens, the cognitive reasoning is powerful. And that's what led us to a paradigm of Rene Descartes, right? The Cartesian, I'm sure we've all heard about, I think, so I am, right? We all know that that is limited because it's human-centric, right? What do I mean by that? Because this paradigm is what led to the limitation of the current view mental health expert use. And if you want to just see how I think so I am is limited, think about the rain, right? You don't need for the rain to happen in order for you to think about it, right? So in order, that's real Descartes, that was a powerful um, evolution for us to, you know, to put a moon, man on the moon and all that. Yes, because that cognitive consciousness, right? I think so I am, I know that I know. But this paradigm again is what led, is what is leading right now mental health expert being stuck. And why, why, what that means is this, the first paradigm, which is basically limitation of mental health um, approach right now is this, the mind is not real. Yes, that's the first paradigm. The mind is not real. 
So the mind is a concept used for mental operation we don't understand. And let me be a little bit more academic here just to show you how this is really important. Um, in fact, Rene Descartes was the first to clearly identify the mind with consciousness and self-awareness and to distinguish this from the brain, which was a seat of intelligence, as they say. So Rene Descartes was the first to formulate the mind-body problem in a form in which it still exists today, right? And on the traditionally dominant substantialist view associated with Rene Descartes, minds are defined as independent thinking substance. But it is more common now in contemporary philosophy to conceive mind, not as substances, but as properties or capacities possessed by humans and higher human animals, right? So when you look at that, let's look at really some of the common assumptions among the theory of the mind. The several assumptions are indispensable to any discussion of the concept of the mind. And some of them that are disputed are basically the mind as a thought, the mind as a knowledge, or the mind as self-knowledge and purpose. So those four assumptions seem to be common to all theory of mind, right? And they seem to be assumptions that require the development of a conception. And even further, let's look at the idea when you go to a Brit Britannica or any psychologist will tell you that the mind is not a scientific concept. In fact, if you look at the Brit Britannica definition of a mind, it says mind in a Western tradition the complex of faculties involved in perceiving, remembering, considering, evaluating, and deciding. So mind is in some sense reflected in such occurrences as sensation, perception, emotion, memory, desire, various types of reasoning, of motives, of choices, threat of personality, and the unconscious. So as you can see, it looks like it's a one bag where you put all, grab it all and just put it there. That's really what they use the mind for. And even look at all the way of some of the pioneer, right? Carl Jung or, you know, Sigmund Freud. All of this, they talk about the mind and really there is no clear definition. It's just one bag where you put it, grab it all. So this is really important. And uh, so, and I thought it was important to go to the source because I think I am is a force. It's because it's only human centric. So, and unfortunately, a lot of self-help Repeating this paradigm, right? We say your thoughts create your reality, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Thoughts are part of a mental dimension, as we talked about in one of my videos. There are five dimensions where humans operate, but the mental dimension is just one of them. And actually, so that's really important that um, you you get that. Um, so the paradigm need to change when it comes to talking about the mind, because this leads us into the second paradigm. You need to understand so that you can effectively tackle this first approach, right? And that second paradigm is this. It's a new understanding you need, is that humans, there are three drivers that drive our experiences. And this solution lies in understanding a new paradigm that was understood since ancient Egypt. But before we dive into this, why is the understanding of this paradigm important? Well, it is simply because of this because of the excessive volume of data we need to process every day. Our brain does three things. Our brain delete, our brain distort, or our brain generalize. So in a way, it creates a filter, right? So, so it creates a filter which makes us prone to illusions, whether the illusions are a good one or a bad one. So regardless, that is at the basis of emotional well-being. And when that happens for the illusions, we get into denial, so either in denial or either avoiding, escaping, or trying to bury your emotion, your true emotions. So the paradigm I'm going to share is very important to understand because I don't have a whole time here to go with over here, but you can find out more about that and by watching my video about the quantum door. And um, so I talk about the quantum door, you can go on my website. But the quantum door is a spirit elevation platform system that equips people to move them from being rigid, to move people from being stuck, to move people from being self-absorbed, to move people from being doubtful, to move people from being frustrated, to move people from being overwhelmed, to moving people to being effectively in the flow, to move them into being confident, at ease in a state of optimal performance. So when you understand the fundamental is that 
where we quantum do leads people. And those three main drivers is important because the fundamental to understand is that your daily experience is driven by three main drivers. Yes, three main drivers. And those drivers are, are the following and not necessarily in this order. But the first driver is social conformity. And the second driver is self-projection. And the third driver is resources. Those three drivers drive our experiences. So if you're to think of it, social conformity is like the pressure or the unseen or the unspoken rule that I impose on people by accepted society norm. And without a doubt, you can imagine if social media nowadays, right? The multitude of social media and then 24 hours news cycle, conformity is elevated to critical levels. So that really has a lot of impact as a driver. Now, the second driver, self-projection, is important because it reflects the doubt. It reflects the insecurities. It reflects the fear that are inherited through our personality, through our weaknesses. When you look at resources, they are important in many ways as well. Because if you were to think about it, if there is a perception of scarcity, it's very simple. Like, will I have enough money? Or will I have enough time? Or will I have enough energy to survive? Or to satisfy my needs or my wants? So these three drivers are at the basis of a formation of four your relations. And they filter particularly when the brain, when the brain delete, when the brain distort, or when the brain generalize. So with that new understanding, that leads us to the most fundamental that the quantum dot teaches, that was at the foundation of ancient Egypt. It's this first paradigm, the third one, third paradigm. And it's this, your reality is spirit actualized into form. Your reality is spirit actualized into form. And this is really key because that's what really allow to discern why there is no mind. Because if you understand the different dimensions where spirit is actualized into form, and very simple, look at the quantum field. It's an energetic field where everything is energy. So if, if you can clearly see that it's a matter of degrees, Meaning, all forms of everything that exist are then just a different manifestation of the energy. Or even you could say that all the forms of everything, they are different forms of energy. And we should know, we all know, that the animating energy that carries the breath, that carries the life power, is one and only one thing. It is your spirit. Meaning your experience is a result and the form of your desires. The visible is a form of invisible. And why that matter here? Because mental constraint that we experience, that people experience, that can appear in setback, overwhelm, frustration, anything you can think of, they are in fact a misalignment from your authentic spirit desires to versus the reality you are experiencing. So the mental constraint you experience is a reflection of a gap between your authentic desires versus the reality you are experiencing. And here's the good news. When you experience that, it's a wake up call, you need to handle it now. But here is the bad news. If you don't, it will keep elevating and turn into a louder crisis. You can go to depression or anything like that. Because the bigger the misalignment and the wider the gap between your authentic desires against your reality, the more you experience emotional pain. And that emotional pain will keep increasing if you don't handle it with awareness because pain is reflecting a deep fear that needs to be resolved. And that is a spiritual work where we need to grow and we need to evolve because fear is protecting an all consciousness level all you that is outdated and that need to be outgrown. So you all heard the term growing pain in all culture. That's the same thing. It's because growth 
and the rebirth is, cyc is cyclical, di dialectic, where two entities apparently oppose fuse to a new conception. So mental setback, mental constraints are reflecting that there are illusions on your way of expressing your authentic desires, and that means there is a need for alignment. So which lead us to our next part. So what do you do instead? This is where my specialty comes in, apply spirit at work. So the first concept you need to understand is a, the first concept is the concept of tension. And that's a basic spirit indicator that allows you to kind of really navigate your reality. So tension as a spirit indicator. So what is tension? You need to understand that it's basically the tension occurs when the illusion from your the three drivers we talk about compared to the authentic desire, right? So there is a tension that occurs when you are not able to see your true reflection because of illusions that are on your way. In a way, like a dusty mirror, right? Where you cannot see reflections, illusions that interfere for you to see your true reflection and that causes misalignment and that causes pain as a result. So spirit reflections are designed to identify the element driver trait, which was seeking expression. And uh, in nature and in the cosmic order, feminine energy and uh, polarity is what start and ignite motion in this plane. The simple example is look at the electron, for example. The electrons have a move. So you know what that means is that meaning an elemental trait, a spiritual trait, seeking to express is always manifested via its absence or a negative trait in this case, right? So I, as an example, very simple, in order to experience courage, you will need to face your fears. So in order to experience, let's say speed, you need to know what, what slow means. So you need a reference. So the goal of reflections are to discern, to help you with the negative trait that was at play and what it was seeking to experience. What was that initial desire? So to find that out, you must go through identifying your pain, then discerning that fear, which will lead you to identify the illusion on why you did what you did by looking at the data. So now, Hope that makes sense and you can see that flow. So as you see the illusions at work, you are able to now to reconstruct using your attention and see what was your desire. And that's a process of evolution, right? I don't have time too much to explain here, but um, that's how you show that you are a co-creator, right? And uh, if you want to dive deeper, uh, the course Radiant Soul is a good course to really, you know, help you, you know, dig further there. Right, you can go on my website to, to see that. But now let's move on. The second step is, uh, now that you understand what tension is, now the next question is, why do I have tension? That's the next step you gotta ask yourself. So it's because there's an expectation of what you want. There is a value, there is an image of what you are supposed to have. So that's the source. So the key secret is to realize that your expectation that you would, you knew you wanted to have is corresponding to an identity and to an image. And the spirit work is for you to see that, to see whether or not that image, to see whether or not that identity, to see or not that value needs to be outgrown. Or if you need to change the action, so the spirit work is really threefold here. One, to uncover that conscious level. And when you uncover it, should you evolve from that? Most likely, yes. Because an object that's at rest stays at rest, otherwise you wouldn't get that. So you review that image, you review that expectation, and now this is where the three lenses help you. The three drivers. So that expectation, is it through a social conformity? Is it through a cell projection? It through uh, one of the resources. So now, if that desire, that expectation is authentic, it means you might need to change your approach. Or that means you will still need to come from an evolved new consciousness level. 
right? And this is really the nutshell of what you need to do. So figure out what tension it is and why you have it. So now, since you stick all the way here, let me give you a bonus tip, and which is you can identify what need to be outgrown, right? How do you identify what need to be outgrown? Just write down all your expectation where you have mental constraint, where you have conflict. That's your part A. Write down all expectation where you have conflict. First, first, first step. Second step, identify all the major assumptions that needed to happen from those expectations, right? So again, write all the major assumptions that need to happen that, that were in your control, but that didn't happen according to you, right? And here it's important to not dwell too much on what you think was not in your control, but why you want to think about what's in your control. Because from that perspective, from that identity, you know that that's the assumption you're making. And the easiest way, use an adjective or an attribute of how you perceive yourself. That will be basically, when you do that, that's basically uncovering the hidden assumption. In other words, right? If something was in your control, but it didn't happen, right? That's where you can see where you fail, or right? Where you, there was a gap. Are you able to see that gap? For example, the lack of trustworthy, right? So, or it can be patient, patient, right? Patient father, patient mother, patient brother, you know, trustworthy leader, right? If that was one of the assumptions, but that didn't happen, you can see now, in a way, that was a trait that was trying to express itself. So maybe you thought you were diligent and the results showed that you are hasty or you're negligent. So here you can see the illusion that drove your actions, right? So when you see the illusion driving your behavior, you can see now why you did what you did. You can see now. You can see, for example, I need to stop being negligent. I need to stop being hasty, right? And when you see that, you can outgrow now that all consciousness and develop being diligent. So by doing that, you are handling the issue of a mental constraint. And I know there is so much I want to add, but I want to make sure that it's not too much. And uh, so really what I want to say is, uh, if you want to know more and continue this conversation with me, please sign up to our brand new community. The community is free souls. You are invited. And I don't know for how long we're gonna keep it free open, but you will get access to more tips. You get access to relevant answers to your real problems. And the link is in my comment below. So also, if you have an issue you want me to talk about, you can submit that in the comments below, or you can request specific video topics by logging onto www.thequantumdo.com forward slash video, right? www.thequantumdo.com forward slash video. Before we leave, as we've seen, right, mental health has become a pandemic that we need to tackle if we don't want it to proliferate, especially with the demand we all are facing nowadays with this new volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The current solutions are missing out on the biggest opportunity to tackle mental health. It is a development and the acceptance and the adherence to spiritual intelligence. When we are faced with mental health constraint, for the most part, it's all about understanding that there is a misalignment between our authentic desires and our reality that we are experiencing. So people need to understand that your reality is spirit actualized into form. Your reality is spirit actualized into form, which means we need to explore our spiritual growth opportunity. That's why I'm here as an applied spirit coach and performance coach to provide you with these different angles that have been known from ancient wisdom practices so that you can leverage your spirit to optimize your performance. So the secret 
is to understand the anatomy of mental constraint and to liberate yourself and so that you can use every mental setback as a lever for your next evolution. When you understand that, you adhere to my favorite quote as always. Failure is a necessary prerequisite to human excellence. Till next time, live your truth. Kushal out.